Hey everyone, Garth Milne is on the show today. Garth is an expert strength and conditioning specialist for golfers and he's trained some of the top golfers in the world. There's two reasons why you should listen to this episode. Number one, if you're not a golfer, we discuss Garth's recipe for success with his newly designed success cube, which I found fascinating and so, so easy to apply in any area of your life where you're looking to improve. The foundation of attitude built on top of a layer of work rate and then finally the skill set on top is just a fantastic analogy and is a great way to create accountability and remove emotion from constructive criticism. If you're a golfer, however, you're going to love this one. We do a deep dive into what happens behind the scenes in the locker room at a live golf event. What's the vibe like there? What's the feeling amongst the players? There's some great stories in there. We also discuss the difference between a Sunshine Tour player and a PGA Tour player and what has to happen to close that gap if they're looking to progress to make the step up in their career. Be sure to like, subscribe, follow the show, share it, please. The more people that get to hear these episodes, the better the guests, the more value, and we can all grow and learn together. Enjoy. Garth Milne, golf fitness extraordinaire, and I can <laughs> safely say also a mentor to me. You've helped me a lot in my decision making and my path along the golf fitness industry. So it's great to have you on. It's nice to have somebody that I've known for a while and who's contributed to me personally and to have a chat um, yeah. about all things golf fitness related. And we'll probably get some life in there as well. Yeah, uh, thanks, and some philosophy, you. I think, too. So, yeah, it's great to have you on. No, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having some time. Yeah. Garth, let's start at the beginning. It's always the best place to start. So give mm-hmm. me some context for you growing up and then how you got to where you are today. So I'm originally from Johannesburg. Uh, I was fortunate enough to go to Pretoria Boys High. It was a boarding school there. Um, and I think all those who, who, who were in boarding school in the, in the mid-90s know it was a, it was a, a, a tough trial. Um, but, you know, you learned a lot. I was, it was good for me because I, I was quite soft through primary school days and obviously going to a school like that um, and experiencing what I experienced, it, it's kind of hardened me up and I really um, came out of my shell a lot, which was great. Um, gave me the courage to go to Rhodes University um, and study, you know, sports science there. Um, but growing up, I was always a good cricketer. Like I played, you know, under, under 19 uh, provincial cricket, made the NAFL side. Moved to, to Rhodes. One of the benefits of Rhodes was that I, I was in the Eastern Province uh, cricket squad as such. Um, it was uh, earmarked for that. But I realized pretty soon that cricket wasn't really what I was going to do um, professionally. Um, and really fell in love with, with the sports science uh, side of things. Um, and, you know, I played cricket at, at Rose University, played golf as well, played all sports. In fact, I, I was in the first team for, for three sports, hockey, cricket and golf. And, um, you know, just really have always immersed myself in, in sport, uh, period. But um, I was going to do uh, a cricket uh, thesis um, in my postgraduate year. There were two guys ahead of me, uh, Rob Walter and Greg King. Um, both sort of you know, a year and two years ahead of me. Um, Rob Walter is now the, the pro tiers white ball coach. Um, and, um, you know, very, very influential guys in my life at that point in time. And, and I was, that's where I was going to go. I was going to go down the cricket path. And, and then in sort of 98, 99, when I was coming into my postgraduate years, a chap by the name of Tiger Woods arrived on the world, on the world stage and, and kind of changed everything for me because what I saw in Tiger made me realize that, hey, if I could really marry my, my true passion, which is golf, I love, I love golf. Um, if I could marry those two passions, you know, golf and fitness together, well then, you know, I could really make my true passion my occupation. And I've been very fortunate enough to do that. So, you know, <clears throat> when I first started at, um, down that road, you know, my, 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 my thesis, there was, no, there was no golf fitness studies. There was nothing done on that. You know, if any, anything that was in a, in a medical journal on, on golf injuries was sort of very acute type stuff, you know, sort of club meat head type thing. Um, but there was no overuse injuries or nothing like that, any performance-based studies. Um, so I, when I was in the UK, um, I spent a lot of time doing um, baseball. So I did baseball, they've been studying baseball for 50 years. And so I did a lot of baseball conditioning um, courses and used baseball um, to sort of validate my, 
my studies because it's kind of the I could say well the bike mechanics is very similar obviously just golf is on an angle baseball's on a horizontal and you know we I was using you know um, batting in, in baseball as a comparative but it's funny because now that we've actually got deeper into the assessment of all we realize that actually throwing is is, is a better indication of, uh, of golf performance but we'll get to that I'm sure but so I really went down the, the baseball route um, and followed baseball conditioning but I did that on the parasa that I was going to then uh, you know, extrapolate this into golf um, and that's kind of where the journey started back in the early 2000s um, and you know I moved back to South Africa in 05 and because I wanted to do golf fitness there was nobody doing golf fitness here there was one gentleman um, Dave Benstead Smith who became a mentor of mine at the time um, and he was part of the PGA of South Africa and it was through Dave that I actually got into the PGA and started working um, and holding the position that I do within the PGA um, and you know the it was a whole brand new industry and you know, I'm very fortunate enough to be be able to to still be doing what I'm doing and loving what, what I do on a daily basis. That's amazing to have your passion as your, your job. You know, the old saying is um, you'll never work a day in your life, that old saying. Mm -hmm. But um, do, you, do you feel like it's work or is it just play, play, play for you? You know, there's, there's times when it's work. There's always that, you know. At the end of the day, it is the job. Um, but honestly, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really do love what I do. I mean, you know, obviously sometimes getting up in the morning when you've got a, you know, a 4.15 alarm clock when you're working on yeah. tour, that, that's, a, that, that's a tough, that's a tough, tough ask. But, um, you know, once I'm there and I arrive at the course and sort of get in my space, uh, I love it. I really, truly, truly do love being out there, being with my players, whether it's, whether it's at a tournament, you know, halfway across the world or whether it's back here in Georgia, Frank, or to the academy, I, I really do enjoy you know, my moments that I have with my players on a, on a daily basis. So what does your, what does a day in the life of Garth look like? I, you sounds like you've got two separate sort of lives, one on tour with your professional players and then Garth's home life where he's got his base. Um, tell me a little bit about how those differ and what you're up to. True. So, yeah, I mean, I've got literally two, two bases. I, I work here at Frankfurt. Um, we run the Golf Academy here. And, um, you know, on that daily basis, I'm sort of up early. I take my son to school. Um, I've got one son who's still here and the other one's actually just started uh, boarding school in, in Cape Town. Um, so I, I take my sons to school and then I, I would head into, into, into the academy and start doing, um, you know, training with, with clients. And those clients are very from my professional golfers that live in the area. Um, as well as, you know, members and uh, people that live within the George community. Um, so, you know, the strength and conditioning realm is, is, is where my, is that's my sweet spot. Um, and I, but obviously, you know, I spend a lot of time uh, in discussion and connecting with our golf coaches here. Um, because often what we find is if I can find a, a physical limitation or something that's going on um, in, the, in the human body, then it helps the coach coach the, the golfer that much better. So, you know, I have a very open relationship with the coaches um, and we do work together as a team to come up with a solution for, for our golfers, be they, you know, elite amateurs or, you know, your, your weekend warrior. Um, so that's really probably the lion's share of my time when I'm here. Um, but to be honest, like the majority of my time is spent with my tour players. I've, I've got a, a number of guys playing um, all over the world. Uh, I've got obviously Dean Burmester on the Live Tour. Do a bit of work with Brandon Grace when he's back here because obviously he hails from this, this neck of the woods. Um, and then I've got guys on the DP World Tour and Sunshine Tour. So, you know, managing those guys is, is, is an important component for me and, and a, a big part of, of what I do. Um, you know, tour life is very different. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very glamorous, don't get me wrong. It's amazing. I get to travel some incredible places in the, in the world. Um, and see some some beautiful um, pieces of property, but you know people ask me say, well, you know, oh, when you were in Paris, did you what, what did you go see the the Eiffel Tower? Did you go to oh, Champ? I'm like, no, guys, I, I saw the golf course, a hotel, and the airport. That's it. Like, literally, we have long days, and particularly us is from a training perspective. Like as I said, I'm up early. We will do a warm up uh, pre round. I'm there throughout the day and then post round we do a, a post round cool down or, or workout depending on what's happening. And, you know, if I've got a, a split of guys, some guys are playing in the morning and some in the afternoon, I mean, I, I can literally have a 15 hour day. So, you know, it, it, that's just how it pans out. Sometimes it's great. I, I, they're all on the same side of the draw and, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shorter day and an easier fit. But, you know, that, that's really the two sides of it. Um, you know, the, the traveling on tour is, is great. I, I really do enjoy being in those moments and enjoy working uh, the, in the professional ranks. 
um, and being part of that that pressure cooker um, moments that are out there on being a professional golfer and, and being on tour with those guys. Um, but it's always nice to come home and actually spend some time, some so-called downtime as such at home as well and to any time with family. Because that's probably the hardest part about being away is, is being away from the family, of course. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, for the listeners and, mm. and the viewers, can you define golf fitness? What does it mean? How does it differ from general fitness for all those golfers who aren't um, getting stuck into the gym already? <laughs> no, look, I think, you know, it, that's, I can't really nail it down into really one simple term, but, you know, really for me, it's about making sure that the human body can function efficiently, effectively, and powerfully all at the same time um, so that you can re repeat your swing over and over again. And, you know, that's really in a nutshell what I do. The, the big thing for me is injury prevention because for me, with my professional golfers, if they get injured, they don't play. If they don't play, they don't get paid. You know, it's not like a footballer who can break his knee and lie on the couch playing PlayStation and still get 300,000 pounds a week or whatever it is. <laughs> These guys get paid. Yeah. You know, like for my guys, you know, if they're not, if they're not playing, they're not getting paid. So, you know, our big thing is, is injury prevention and keeping them fit and healthy. And then there's obviously the performance uh, ramifications as well. So, you know, when we look at a, at a golf swing, you know, in its multi-plan and multi-dimensional movement pattern, um, you really are developing a, a, an athlete, an overall athlete. Um, and there's a number of different elements and key things that need to go into, in, into building a, a golfing athlete. Um, and I, like I said, a lot of the time it will be engaging with that player's golf coach, making sure that what I'm doing in the gym can support what they're doing out in the, on the driving range and therefore onto the golf course as well. So I, I, I'm a I'm a big believer in 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 Occam's razor. You know the least minimum effective dose. You know what's the least amount I need to do to get the most effect. And you know if I can you know, like narrow it down to a 45 minute training session in the gym, so that I can do as much as I can in that space of time. Anything more than that, that's a waste of time. That could be spent you know on the chipping green or the putting green, where they really could be really honing their skills and and, and developing their their skill set as a, as a professional golfer or as an elite level golfer. So it's not to say that you mustn't be in the gym. Obviously, I said the minimum effective dose that you have to dose yes. it. You have to put them in, into some form of a stressful situation. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I kind of I package it very much specifically to that individual athlete. And I think that that really is the nuts and bolts of what we do. The assessment protocols and the diagnostics is, a, is, a, is essential um, because once we get that right, then building the program on top of that is, is, is actually quite easy. But it's getting the diagnostics right from the, from the outset that's very, very important. Yeah, that's so important. I, w I was actually coming to a minimal effective dose a bit later, so you okay. beat me to the punch. Um, <laughs> there's a difference that I, one of the main things that I've learned, especially over the last year or two, is there's a difference between working hard and, and working smart. Mm. And, and it's glamorous to say, you know, hardest worker in the room, 15 hour day, da, 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 da. But, but these are athletes that also need to look after their body and part mm -hmm. of looking after their body means rest and recovery, mm -hmm. um, which is not really glamorous and it doesn't get Instagram likes and all of that type of thing. <laughs> yeah, so that's true. I, yeah. And, and I think that that's something that often gets missed on, um, on a lot of people is working smart versus working hard. Um, True story. Speak, yeah. Speaking of working smart, I love this this cube that you've got going. You've got the success yeah. cube. Uh, yeah. Is that what it's called? It's called the success cube. Yeah. I put one on my desk here. No. So this is so, it. So tell me about the success cube. The cube. That cube. looks. Okay. That looks amazing. Thank okay. You. So basically, what the success cube is, it's really simple, as you can see. It's literally just mm. six duper dots. I mean, this is what it is. Okay. Yeah. But. It's really used as a tool because what it does is it helps define what success is for you as an individual, like in whatever task it is that you do. Right? So in order to be successful in any, any, any task, right, we can basically break down my performance, let's say in a round of golf or a putting challenge or a presentation to your, your board. We can break it down into three basic fundamental levels. We've got my skills that I have. We've got my work rate. And ultimately, we've got my attitude around that. So, you know, building a, a success cube like this, if I'm 100% on those three levels, I'm going to have a successful cube-shaped block once I'm done with it. If I don't, and if I can say, say my skills are not optimal, well, then I'm going to build up my cube like that when I do my appraisal of it. And you'll see that that does not create a perfect, successful-looking cube. 
Now, okay. again, this is this is purely a, a tool, and because it's a manipulative with with colours and 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 this, the sound, it really does stimulate sort of the, the cognitive side of of things, and really opens up your your right brain, not just your left. And I must say, I've had some of the most incredibly open, you know objectively subjective conversations with with my athletes in fact some of them have been with my with my two sons in fact um because what the nice thing about the cube is what it does as a tool if we are talking about let's say a round of golf and i said to you okay well let's look at your what you did today and let's build out the cube based around your attitude your work rate and your skill set okay and we now put this cube on the table we now talk about the cube not about you as an individual and i'm not like i'm pounding you as as a human being we're now discussing this entity that's sitting in front of us on the table, which is a great way to just extract the emotional um, you know, attachment to my performance. And we all know that that is the biggest you know, crutch to success, is when you pull emotion into a, an assessment, well then you, know, you, throw, you end up throwing the baby out of the bathwater, and, and that's no good. And honestly, and I say this to our parents, I'm sure you have had the same situation, like the worst time to discuss around the golf is within 45 minutes of you coming off the golf course. And I'm afraid that is when most rounds of golf with junior golfers and their parents are discussed, right? In the car, on the way home. So tell me about your round of golf. Or I watched mm. you do this. I mean, it's probably the worst thing you can do at that point in time. Whether the, whether the golfer has had a great day or, or, or a bad day, it doesn't matter. Like, it, it needs to be time to let it slide, let it go, and then decompress and then address it at a later time. And, and, and actually creating the success cube um, – based around that performance, is it's been incredible. It really has helped facilitate open, honest conversation and discussion and then finding solutions with my golfing athletes. And, I mean, I, the guy that developed this, actually, he worked in a, in a software development company, and he used it in a managerial space, you know, working with his staff. Um, and it's based around, a, it's called Lego Six Bricks, is a, is a concept that Lego use, and they put it into, into a lot of business management structures. But he kind of pulled it into the cube, you know, with the six, and and this extrapolated them out into what we see here. So, the the cube in and of itself, I mean, it's just six Duplo blocks, but it's the yeah. power that lies within the structure that you create based around a specific task performance, and then you can have an open ended discussion about that, about that performance, um, you know, between a facilitator and a and a student or a pupil and a and a teacher. Uh, or a coach and a and a, and a sports a sports person. I I think um, you know the the my colleague at at Success Cube, my colleague, like we've got a vision that we would like to see one of these on every single classroom desk in South Africa, and why not you know across the world? Because I think if we could use this type of thing you know appropriately, this tool to provide that type of discussions, um, I think it can really really help help a lot of people who are, who are really struggling with with performance based appraisal. Yeah, I, I 100% agree with you. And I think it also, it creates an element of accountability, like you say, but without um, attaching any kind of emotional feeling of um, a personal attack on that, that individual. So, if you know, like if I'm, if I'm a, a golfer and I know that I'm coming back to, to chat to you maybe the following day or mm. in a phone call two hours later, and in my mind, I'm already going through, okay, this is where this is kind of what my block is going to look like. This is what my cube is going to look like, and and just from an individual standpoint, then it takes the emotion out of it when judging myself too. Instead of getting instead of getting too emotional and too caught up in oh I should have done this or I'm a terrible putter or I um mm. uh, I, I can't hit, I can't hit a tee shot on that one particular hole, it immediately removes that element of also self attack. Um, that you can yeah. look at it objectively yeah. and say, okay, cool. It's not yeah. me, but that that part of the cube was out today or that Correct. part of the cube is consistently out. It's Correct. not Clinton is a bad person or yep. it's that yep. it removes that whole element of negative self-talk, which is something that most golfers um, fall victim to quite a lot, yeah. um, both amateur and professional, because I know there's a couple True of those T-box mics that um, pick up a couple yeah. of crazy little yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> your so the cube are the, the the blocks are they arranged in a particular order for a reason so you've got what's on the bottom there is it attitude so attitude is the bottom right because really for me fundamentally attitude is the foundation of any performance like if i come into something with a poor attitude 
<laughs> chances of being successful are, are, are slim and none. So, you know, the attitude is, is key. That is pivotal. That is my foundation on which I can build success. Okay. Um, and, you know, the nice thing about this is we can label these two colored blocks if we want. We can look at it and say, okay, well, as a coach, I've spoken with you about two things in your attitude, positivity and, you know, focus or something like that, you know. And if we did that well, well, then we'll align it so that it's perfectly aligned at 100% like that, you know. And then we can shift it off the axis like so. So that would be 75% performance, yeah, 50% and blah, blah, as you see. Okay. So then that creates that separation in attitude no longer being a strong foundational base. It doesn't look like the cube yeah. does it, but it's the that represents. Yeah. So, so, you know, once we've created that, then we know that from that we can then look at work rate and then skill set. And, you know, so many times, this is the problem is, and I'm, I'll use golf because obviously that's the mode where we're at, but so many times people, when they have a bad round of golf, what's the first thing that they blame? My swing. My swing is terrible. I can't swing. I can't hit the ball. Blah, 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 blah. And meanwhile, they'll stand on the range and they'll flush it. You know, you'll put it on the camera and it's perfect. You look at their 3D numbers, unbelievable. And yet, but they'll constantly go back to their technique or their skills. And we know that so many times that's not the case. You know, I work quite closely with a, a, a mental coach, Theo Bezadnos. And it's like, you know, we bang our head against the wall because we've got mutual clients and we're watching this going, well, that's not the problem. <laughs> you know? Because you can, it's purely the yeah. attitude that they bring to that, to that performance or to that, you know, second round or the final round or whatever it might be, the back nine, you know, whatever. Um, that shift, that attitude balance changes because of the situation that they find themselves in, be it Friday, cut day or Sunday, you know, you know, make, make a lead, move up a leaderboard day. Um, mm. and, and for me, the, the foundation for success is around my attitude leading into that task or that performance or that round or that whatever it might be, that presentation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then what have you got on the second block there? So obviously then work rates. So like my work rate would be, let's say, you know, we, we're talking about your putting performance in a round of golf. Okay. So we'll, we'll talk about your, your attitude around your putting. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we'll talk about your work rate. So I said, well, listen, you, how many putts did you have? I had 36 putts today. Okay, that's not great. Okay, but now, you know, we know that you, there's two things in your in, in your stroke that we need to work on, right? Because in your skill set, you, you struggle to start the ball online, okay? Okay, so let's go back with your coach. Okay, how, how, we've got drills for that, right? We've got gates or tees in the ground or whatever it might be that we do to work on your, your start line. How much start line work have you actually done? You know, and we can go, well, I've only done probably three, three hours work. Okay, well, can we really expect your, to own the skill set of start line if you've only done three hours of work? You know, uh, well, you know, you know, I really just struggle standing on the putting green. I get bored. Okay, well, then your attitude around your putting sucks. So we're going back to attitude at the beginning. So then you're going in reverse. You're getting, exactly. you're getting lower and exactly. lower down the cube. <laughs> 100%. So it all stems back to attitude. But then we can, but the nice thing is we can point point where the problem is. Like, let's say you've got a really unbelievable attitude around your putting. Like, you've actually changed your attitude. Like, you, you, you want to be better and you're willing to work. You're willing to put the time. You're willing to be soft with your putting and blah, blah, blah. Well, then you just got to do the work. Like, you're not that far off. Just keep going. It'll come. We know, you know, it's all about the number of reps we do, right? The 10,000 hour rule or whatever that is that yes. Mount Rad will popularize. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, that's what it is. It's, it's in the reps, you know, and, and I've just got to do more reps. Yeah. I'll give you the greatest player ever. Tiger Woods would say that. He'd just say, I've just got to do the reps. I've got to lay down the mile and, you know, what he once said in an interview. So, you know, it's just about the work rate. I just need to do repeatedly um, that skill and I will start to own it. Now, yeah, that's part of where the work rate fits in. And then obviously, like okay. I said, obviously the top is skills. Obviously, I need the skills in order to be able to execute it. I mean, I can come in with the best attitude in the world and have done the work, but, but until I actually own the skill sets, I'm not going to be able to compete, you know, at my club championships or, you know, on the PJ Tour. It's, it, it's the level of demand that's here that, that's needed. But the ability to attain the skills is dependent on the work that I put in with the attitude that I have towards it. So, you know, we all know that, you know, supposedly, you know, practice makes perfect, but it's more a case of, you know, perfect practice or as we know, deliberate practice. So if I have the right type of attitude towards my practice, I'm going to be practicing deliberately with the right type of attitude and focus and commitment to what I'm doing. And when I do that, I actually attain that skill that much faster. And we know that when you are actually fully focused into the task um, at hand, the skill is embedded way deeper way faster um you know through you know what we what we call neuroplasticity into the into the motor cortex and you know i've got a device called halo which is amazing and it really shows you know where you are at 
from a focus perspective and it actually helps to prime neuro prime the, the, the brain to to take on a, a motor skill um, and but you have to come with the right attitude to to that moment or to that that process because if you just think that it's a load of hogwash well then it's, it's never going to take effect because you are putting that that block up into your ability to actually create a, a learning environment very nice so mm. with the success cube you've got your attitude you've got your work rate and then you've yep. got your skill set You've very traveled. You've been to many tournaments around the world, many majors where the best golfers in the world are on exhibition. Have you noticed a difference in those three sections of that, of that success cube between our local professional golfers and then the cream of the crop? Yeah, I mean, uh, the answer is obvious, isn't it? It's a massive golf. Mm. And I'm afraid... Mm. You know, no, maybe that's a bit unfair. The, the golf is, it's not that big. Like the difference between being like a successful on a local Sunshine Tour and being on the PGA Tour, it's, it's that big. That's the distance. Honestly, that's how far it is. Mm. But the amount of stuff that's in that space, it's unbelievable. Yeah. And that's why, because it's such a small space with so much inside it, the pressure is huge. And that's why so many guys crack under that pressure. So, you know, I, I said it earlier, we are what we repeatedly do, right? We, we have startle. So, you know, uh, those guys that are successful, that are out there at the top of the game, they are, that's a non-negotiable. Like, they do not forego time spent on the range, on the putting green, on their short game, in the gym, with their physio. Yeah, that, those are non-negotiable entities that have to be in place for them to be able to succeed. And they have a structure and a team and an environment around them that supports that. Because you're competing against guys now, you know, it's hard to say this, but, you know, the game has advanced so much. Golfers are professional athletes nowadays. You know, 30 years ago, they were not athletes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Let's be honest. I mean, there, 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 were, there were a handful that were actually doing what we needed to be done. I mean, obviously, you know, Mr. Gary Player, who's obviously a mentor for all of us in this, in this industry, like... He, he, he was the, the he was the guy that that first broached this whole idea you know and and he was you know vilified for it and and you know, mm. he was told you're, you're a fool but you know proof is in the pudding look at it now you know so and but like I said when tiger arrived I, he he really pushed the needle and moved the bar that much higher and people had to to jump to get there and that's why I think it's inherently so much harder to win a major nowadays you know because there's so many guys that are actually at that elite level that can perform, that can win on a day now or win in a week, you know. So, you know, to say the Tiger's the greatest of all time over and above Jack, that's not fair. You know, to say the Jack is the greatest over and above Walter Hagen, that's also not fair because you're not comparing people in the same era, you know. And guys will say that, well, you know, Tiger had to beat, you know, 60 guys to win a major. Jack had to beat 30. And what? Uh, uh, maybe the, that's what has happened now, you know. When, when you go to a major championship now, there's, there are, there are probably 60 guys, half that field are actually at that level where they could win the tournament that week. Um, and then we can n narrow it down to probably 30 guys that are really in that sweet spot of having got everything right and everything is, you know, um, primed and ready and uh, optimized for them to be able to perform at their, at their best. Um, but, you know, th that, that I'd say is, is the biggest difference that I see is that level of professionalism an unwavering commitment to that process of being the best that I can be every single day. Like it's, it's incredible. And it's like, and I think until you actually spend some time in that space out there watching and seeing and experiencing and engaging with, if you're fortunate enough with those guys, you don't realize how, I wouldn't say it's a morbid fascination, but my word, it's very close to a morbid fascination mm. with the game and with becoming excellence, you know. But it's almost like, you know, golf is the endless pursuit of perfection, knowing that you're never going to achieve it. And, you know, I, I had that conversation with George Kutzer once, and, and, and he actually finished the sentence, you know, knowing that you're never going to achieve it. But you have to stay committed to wanting to attain perfection because <laughs> otherwise, mm. what are we doing here? You know, because... You know, that's that's probably the difference, and that's you know what I see on our local tour, tour here in the Sunshine Tour. It's not to say guys don't want it; they do. They're just not willing to put in the hours and the effort and commitment and and the non-negotiables to get there. You know, I always say there's a thing of no option or no choice. Like, if you want to be successful in this sport, 
and your friend says to you, come, let's go and have a couple of beers. You, you don't, that's not even an option for you. The answer is no, straight. It's like, sorry, dude, no, I, that's not even, I, I can't even entertain that question because that doesn't even fit within my framework of becoming the best that I can be. If you even just consider going out with your mates and you know, having a bender, like, then it's off the table. Sorry. Yeah. So like that's, I'm afraid, the level that it has to be. However, on the flip side, that morbid fascination can also be your biggest Achilles heel too. And I've seen that with certain players that we've worked with. You've, they, they fully commit 110% into their process and, and it doesn't quite happen for them. And it's almost like that outside pressure is just too much for them because they're like, well, I'm doing all the work. Why is it not happening? I want the results. And they really put even that, there's even more pressure on them, whether it's in, intrinsic or extrinsic, that's hard to say, but you know, often it will become an intrinsic pressure. It's like, well, I'm putting on, doing all this work, I'm doing all the right things. Why is it, why am I not, you know, number one in the world or, or, or winning tournaments? Well, I'm afraid it's not as simple as that, you know. And that's the hard part, is that you have to stay committed to the process. You have to trust that and you have to believe that it will, it will come your way, but there's no guarantees. Yeah, I love what you say there about belief. So I had a conversation with one of my clients about a month ago and I painted a picture for him and I said, okay, so here we've, we've got a plan, right? You've got your plan for your, from your golf coach. You've got your plan from your fitness coach. Yep. If you did everything and you followed it to the T, to the letter, didn't waver once for a year, I can then guarantee that you, by this stage next year, would have won You'd be off the sunshine turn, you'd have uh, two DP World Tour wins and mm -hmm. you would be on the brink of competing in your first major. Yes. Would you do it? And he said, yeah, Clint, absolutely I would. Why wouldn't I? I mean, that's a no-brainer. So yeah. And I said, yeah, exactly. So why don't you? You have to act with the unwavering faith and belief that what you're doing is going to guarantee the result that you're after. Mm -hmm. um, so then I asked myself, well, then why, why do you guys, why do they not do it? Mm. Because if that is the case, then what is stopping them from having that mindset? And what I've come back to is that there's a lack of self-belief in either the process or in themselves that deep, deep down, they're fearful that even if they put the work in, they're fearful that they might not get there. Yeah. Um, and that's what I've come to. I don't know if it's right. I don't know if it's wrong. That's um, how I've sort of pieced it together in my head. Mm. But I'd be interested to find out what you think about those um, sort of musings. Yeah, I think, um, well, I think from my personal experience, like I had, I had it, was, it was very similar to a, a Kevin Peterson type situation back in the day. So... You know, obviously being, you know, in the late 90s, South Africa, New South Africa, and affirmative action was, was, was pretty strong in sports at that time. And, and, you know, that's why I gave up on my cricketing career because I, I, I saw the writing on the wall. I'm afraid, you know, it didn't matter how well I performed, there was no guarantee that I would be selected. And, you know, I understand why and I appreciate that and, you know, fully support, you know, the, the efforts that have been made. So because that was taken away from me, I was like, well, you know, if I'm, I'm going to put in all this time and effort, I'm going to drive all the way to Port Elizabeth to go to, you know, practices and stuff. I mean, I mean from Grahamstown to PE, that's a dangerous road, you know. And I thought, well, if I'm going to be doing this, you know, two, three times a week and still not get picked, I mean, I'm pretty much putting my life at risk over whether I'm actually going to be successful in the sport or not. So, like, you know, and, and, then, and that was my decision. I said, well, then I'm not willing to, I'm not willing to do that. And I not found my, my true calling at that point in time because I really fell in love with the with the strength and conditioning and the fitness side of things. So, you know, it's, it's not just that one isolated thing that made my decision for me. But I think, no, that is that is a fair comment to say, I think people would look at that and go, okay, well, you're telling me that I need to do all this work. And at the end of the day, there's still no guarantee. Well, then no, I'd, I'd rather go and, and you know, go to university, study a degree, and then get into the business world and away we go, or whatever it is, you know or start a business and become an entrepreneur because I know at least then there's some success is kind of, you know, on the horizon for me. So I think that that's part of the, of the, the, the challenge is that those guys that have made it and girls, um, they have a, a firm belief inside, inside here that is burning 
because if you don't have that, you're not going to go and stand up there on that putting green, you know, in the rain. You know, I, I remember going to, um, to Dissolza in Cape Town um, to go see um, a coach there, Murray Smith, one day. Um, and it was hammering it down with rain. And when I drove in, there was this kid standing on the range, lefty, hitting balls in the rain. And when I got there, I said to him, I said, who's that kid? And he goes, no, they, his name's Garrick Higgo. He's this young kid. You know? and, and that was three, four years before he, he burst onto the scene. And I mean, I mean his, his, his rise has been meteoric. I mean, to get to where he is on the PJ Tour in such a short space of time. Um, but that's, I'm saying that, that, that that's what was needed. You know, he, he had an unwavering belief that he was going to get there and he was willing to do whatever needed to be done to do so. So much so that he was standing in the driving range hitting golf balls because that's what you need to do. And the vast majority of other kids his age would have looked at that and said, not help, let's go inside and go play PlayStation, you know, or whatever it is. You know, so like that, I'm afraid, is, is what's needed in order to be successful is to go, you know, I may know deep down in my heart that there's a chance that this might not happen, but I'm willing to give it a go nonetheless. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, action. Take action as if uh, your action is going is is going to guarantee the outcome that you want. Sure. Um, and I think that's with that's with anything. You can. There's mm. a lot of uh, correlations you can take with things like weight loss. Um, for people who are looking to lose weight, you have yep. to you have to meal prep. You have to go to the gym. You have to do all of these things, and you yeah. have to behave in a way um, that what you're wanting to achieve is going to be guaranteed at the end. True. Um, and I think, you know, the, the thing for me, like massive Clinton is your why. Like, what is your why? What is your reason? And I mean, Simon Sinek, we've all watched that TED talk or mm -hmm. been around it. And it's true. If you don't have a strong why, a reason, and it needs to be at the pinnacle of you know, what drives you, um, you're not going to get up in, in the morning at 4 a.m. to go to that gym session or to get on a flight to go halfway around the world and leave your family behind, you know, um, it, that why is, is key. That why is essential. Um, and it is the foundation for, for success. And, you know, I've had this discussion with, with numerous coaches and mental folks and some of my players as well. It's like, there's a level, a level of grit that needs to be part of that. And why drives grit, you know, and Angela Duckworth, her book's great. But, you know, at the end of the day, like I, your why actually drives everything. Um, because it, you know, do you have had to have gone through hardship in order to ha be gritty? You know, like you, you look at a number of successful people at some point in their life, you know, in their formative years, or whatever, they've had moments where they've experienced hardship or heartbreak or a tough upbringing, you know, whatever it might be. And I must say to them, like, well, is that a proviso in order to be successful? You have to have had some form of hardship as a child. Well, I don't think that's true, um, but I do think that you need to have been taught and exposed to hardship and realize that, you know, in order to be successful, we have to embrace failure. And I mean, it's such a cliche, but, you know, so many cliches hold true because there's truth in cliches. And I think that that is essential that as a, as a parent, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing on a, on a, well, I'd say a regular basis as much as I can because I, I want to expose my children to that. I want to expose them to failure and hardship and what it means to, to you know, put it on the line and fail, you know, and how to embrace that and, you know, not, not forego it, you know, because there's lessons to be learned in, in those failures and, and in those experiences. And that builds and creates grittiness, you know, that resilience to, to continue to fight and to, to engage and press forward and whatever that might be in, in your, in your pursuit of excellence or whatever, the, where are we going in this, whether it's, yeah. you know, studying for maths or, you know, working on, on, on your, your cricketing skills, you know, um, that, that grittiness or that resilience is, is key. And, you know, we, we can, as parents can create that environment for a child, but it also needs to be a, an environment where, you know, your child feels, or your, let's say your, your student feels comfortable failing in front of you. Yeah, I think that's so important. And so many parents, we, we want to protect our children. We don't want them to have struggled. No, you know, because I struggled. You know, I struggled as a, as a child. So I don't want my child to struggle. Yeah? But that's, 
That's BS. Like you are, we are where we are because of that struggle. Why would I rob my child of that ability to go through the, the, the struggle so that they can get that understanding and that appreciation and the resilience to be successful? Like why would I take that experience away from them that I was privileged, privileged enough to to experience? It's a it's that massive conundrum that I find, you know, and it's hard because you don't want to see your child struggle. You don't want to see them cry at the end of a hockey game or a cricket match or around a around a golf. But I'm afraid that's that's part and parcel of that passage to, to becoming a success is you have to have gone through that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one of my favorite sayings, I can't remember who it was by, but it said, um, show me somebody who has never failed and I will show you somebody who's never tried. I yep, can't remember who that. said that. Love that. But, 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 but that, is, that is exactly it. Um, mm. And then the most successful people that I've seen and learned from have the healthiest relationship with failure if you've got an unhealthy relationship with failure then the fear becomes uh, overwhelming anxiety provoking which is going to affect your performance your mental and emotional state your relationships all of that True. so the most successful people have the best relationship with failure and taking it back to golf uh, there's no sport where you fail more often than golf. <laughs> true story <laughs> so, so you you have to yeah. if you want to be a good golfer you've got to be absolutely okay yeah. with failing yeah yeah 100 um, you gotta embrace that yeah goth you have spent some time on the live tour so mm. we we're gonna go there and okay I'd like to, and and i'd like to get your thoughts on it because you've been in um, working with Dean Burmester, who's part of the Stingers group. Mm -hmm. um, and you've now been to a couple of these events, more, well, more than a couple. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got some behind the ropes um, opinions and we, no, none of this armchair critic stuff like me sitting in my room sure. here. Um, <laughs> what is it like and what do you think about Liv? I think Liv's been great for golf, period. I think it's exposed... Um, tours uh, for what they really are. I think it's shown that the, the true product of a tour is the players. Um, you know, it, at the end of the day, you know, myself as a consumer or as a fan of golf, I'm going to go watch an event because I want to be entertained. I, 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 you know, I get up in the morning and I put the TV on and I watch, you know, the highlights of the golf the night before, or I stay up until God knows what hour here in South Africa to watch the PGA Tour because I'm a fan of the game and I want to see those players perform. I'm not watching the PGA Tour because, you know, of what the PGA Tour is. I'm watching the best players in the world compete against each other on the PGA Tour or on the DP World Tour or whatever it is, you know. And I think it's made, when, when the PGA Tour were threatened with the loss of their product, which was these top players, I think they got scared and they realized that, oh my word, we're in trouble here. So first and foremost, I think that's important that we understand that, you know, at the end of the day, this is a, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be part of this traveling circus that <laughs> she goes, you know, around the world, you know, creating these little entertainment, you know, moments for people to engage and enjoy and, and attend. And, and that's what it is. It's an entertainment industry. And, and you know, the golfers are, are the, the, the key characters in, in that circus performance. But obviously, you know, there's, there's people behind the scenes that support them in that sense and shape. And the circus wouldn't be around, I get that too, if it wasn't for the tour. So it's like, it's a delicate balance between satisfying the players and then obviously building a tour and satisfying the sponsors. But, you know, sponsors want to invest in a tournament because of the players that it can attract, right? We, that we've always seen that, you know, some sponsors are willing to pay more to, you know, pay appearance fees for players to be there. So guys, this has been going on for a very long time in a sense. Okay, all right. Creating a product. Okay, that people want to be a part of. So I was fortunate enough now in, in July um, to travel to the UK with my family as well. And we did the British Masters, which is at the Belfry. We did the Live London event, and then we did the Scottish Open. So three very different golf tournaments, three different tours in that sense, because we had a purely DP World Tour event, Live, and then a co-sanctioned DP World Tour with the PGA Tour. So we had some really big players playing in the PGA Tour event. So, and actually three very different tournaments in that sense of what they were offering. And I said this to my wife when we were at the Belfry. I said, just look around at the people that are attending the Belfry. Look at the demographic. Look at the demographic when we go to live and look at the demographic when we go to the Scottish Open. And, you know, obviously the, the Belfry, I'm sure you can gather, was men over the age of 40 and women, okay, but way more men, loads of more men, 
okay? And that was definitely the average, over the age of 40 and up, okay? Then we go to live. <laughs> Men under the age of 40, between the ages of 25 and 40, okay? Women, way more women. My wife was like, wow, there's so many more females here. And kids, loads of kids. Now, obviously, at the Belfry, there were kids there, but they were there with their dad, which is great. Don't get me wrong. Like, that's such an important component for a father and a, and a son to experience and enjoy it. But Liv is, is targeted at a completely different demographic. So for someone to say, oh, you know, Liv is taking people away from the, their nights, they're actually bringing a whole new entity. It's a completely different product for a completely different market in that sense. And yes, the music is a big part of it and the hoopla and the, the vibes and the team structure and the colors and the lights. And the, I mean, every time we got to that Live London event, we arrived and my boys just legged it straight for the, the spectator village because they've got such cool things happening there and there's music and like, obviously they've got DJs and they've got bands and it, that's a big part about it. It's an entertainment weekend, really, you know, um, Friday through, through Sunday. So, you know, it's a completely different entity in that sense. But what I like about it is it has drawn a whole new demographic into the sport. Um, you know, the Scottish Open was amazing because, you know, we had the best players in the world there. Um, and it was really, you could see that there, there was a, there was a more of a, a across the board uh, from an age group perspective, male and female, a lot of youngsters there. And I think, you know, the likes of, you know, Rory and Victor Hovland and, you know, these guys have really sort of, you know, drawn a lot of youngsters into the game. And, and golf is cool nowadays, you know. Um, so people want to come and watch them. So that's how I see the three different elements of it, or the two in particular. Like Live is, yeah. Live is its own um, product. Um, the environment that we're in, particularly the Stingers team as such, have really got it right. I mean, there's some really good guys in that team. They get on really well. I mean, Charlotte, Louis, and Brandon are thick as thieves. And obviously, Dean coming on um, was a very... I'm going to say logically easy fit. You know, he, he's that type of guy. He's a very open, very lovable, very engaging um, human being. Honestly, he's one of the nicest guys I've ever met in my life. He really is a lovely man. Um, and But he's always been about the team. You know, he's a great college boy. So it's always been about, you know, the badge and stuff. And now he has a badge on his on his chest that he can represent. And, and you know, when, when the opportunity to go to live came up, like his coach and I, Grant Fenster, and I chatted about it. And, and that was one of the pros and cons on the pros list. If you literally got a piece of paper out and draw a line, there might have pros and cons. You know, and one of the pros was being part of a team environment because we knew that Burmy would thrive in that space. He would really get up for it. And it was funny. Uh, you, you'll appreciate this, Clinton. Like the first tournament he played in was in Mexico. And we were there. And on the Sunday, he... Um, I, I had to leave early because I had to get a flight back to Florida. But I was staying at his place and he flew home on the Sunday night. And then on the Monday, we drove to the airport and we were talking on the plane. And I asked him about, uh, sorry, on the way to the airport. And we were talking about his final round. And he said, gee, like on the last five holes, I had four, the four of the easier holes on, in my rotation. Because obviously, you know, it's 54 holes, shotgun start. So he was finishing on an easier stretch. And he knew that he needed, we needed two more birdies as the Stingers to finish third alone. And, and he knew that the ball was on his racket. And he gave himself good chances. And he missed all five of them. Okay? And he said to me, he said, you know what? I was really disappointed with myself, obviously. But the moment I was over that putt or over that ability to make that shot, I felt completely different. Like the pressure that I had on me when I was a PJ Tour player was, if I don't make this, I suck. I have no good. Mm. I don't belong out here. Whereas... Standing over those putts, he was like, I want to make this for the greater good of my teammates. So it, it was an extrinsic driver, not an intrinsic pressure. And it was amazing. And, I, and he was saying it, and I just started giggling. And he like looked at me and said, what? <clears throat> and I said, do you remember we spoke about this? He goes, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah you, you and Grant did. So like, you see, like, uh, that, that realization is, is, is amazing. And that, maybe that just underpins the difference of what – the live structure is about. It's it's not about the, the the individual. It's about the team. And no none was even more evident than when you know Cam Smith missed that putt on the 18th hole, at um, on the final hole at, at at this last live event in London. You know he had that putt to for, to force a playoff between this thing uh, between the Aces and and the Rippers, and he missed it. He still won the, the individual event, won $4 million that everyone thinks is the most important thing. But he was gutted. He was absolutely gutted. Like, and then they wanted to celebrate. And you could see almost like bashfully, he was like, oh, 
yeah, okay, so I won the individual, I think, you know, and stood up there with the trophy. But he, he didn't want to be there holding that trophy. He wanted his ripper mates up there holding the other one, you know. And that, that yeah. just really validated what, that's, what live is about. It's about the greater good. It's about the team environment is a huge component to it. And I know it's going to take time for people to, to buy into it and see it and, and for what it is um, and understanding what the team aspect is. But honestly, it's like a big driver of what Live is about. It's about creating a, an identity and a team around that structure. And I, like, a, some teams have got it right. You look at what the, 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 the Rippers have got it, the Stingers have got it, the Range Ghosts have got a great structure. There's other guys that, other teams that don't. I mean, the, the, the Majestics, although they're not playing great golf, but they, they are definitely ahead of the game. They're at the point of the spare and all the things, what it means to build a team, like a Formula One type team, you know, with their sponsors and their support and their whatever it is, um, and their backing and everything behind them. Um, you know, other teams have got good players, but they just haven't quite got their chemistry right. And, you know, they, they need to get that right because they, they're losing traction in the, the support base because they don't have that, that pointed why. You know? yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, so one of my, my biggest things with Liv is where do we go to from here in, in the sense that as a consumer of golf, the four tournaments that I really pay attention to are the majors. Hands and, down. and that is how all of these guys measure themselves. Mm -hmm. How many majors have you won? Mm -hmm. How do you perform in the majors? Mm -hmm. And that for me, I don't have, I've never had an issue with live. My concern is as a consumer, how do we get the best players in the world, the most informed players in the world, all competing at the majors? And that is my major, excuse the pun, concern. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. true story. And I think, you know, that's, that's part and parcel of why this merger had to happen for the good of the game, because the wedge that was being driven between those on one side and those on the other, it was, it was destroying that, what you've just spoken about, you know, that, that legacy, that, that pinnacle of, of the sports is the majors. The majors are those four majors. And you can, like you said, you get measured on those. You, you win a couple, you into the hall of fame, you know, and that was taken away from those players that made that decision to go. And I'm not, you know, vindicating that decision. They made that decision knowing full well what the ramifications of that decision were at the time. I think, you know, as things have started to play out and we started to see this, I know having spoken with people involved in the in three of those four majors, they were looking at ways to allow or to accommodate for live players to, to play, not just purely relying on world ranking as the main category, for example. Um, and I know that, you know, I spoke actually with Phil Mickelson about it. Um, over one of his four wellness coffees, in fact. But, you know, we, and he said, like, we, they're going to have to create a category for Liv. Like, you know, so, you know, the Masters will be the top 50 players in the world plus the top five Liv players, you know, at, at the end of the, 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 the calendar year or the season the, the previous year, you know, as an example. Um, yes. They're going to have to figure out the world ranking situation. If they're going to go on world rankings and make that the, the main sort of gauge of... Um, you know, assessment of ability or, or whatever you are, whatever you want to call it, that ranking, they're going to have to figure out a way to accommodate those players that are playing on live. I know that it's 54 holes, which is an issue. There's no cut. That's also an issue. But, you know, th there's, there's a way around everything for sure. But I think now that this so-called merger, this, well, this merger between the PIF and, and um, the PGA Tour, you know, that in and of itself, they're going to have to figure out the minutia of how to absorb or reallow those players that resign their membership from the PGA Tour to then, you know, reinstate that membership. And I know that that was actually in that memo that was sent to the PGA Tour to the players. I've seen that memo. And that was one of the bullet points was that we will investigate how best to do this. But it will only be at the end of the 2023 season um, for next year. And we will talk about whatever you know, it has to happen in order for that to, to occur. What, and I presume that would be what sort of sanctions those players would have to um, fulfill or fines that have to be paid. You know, I, I'm not sure what that's going to be like. I mean, that's, that's for lawyers who are going to really delve into the, the, the regulations of being a PGA to a member mean. Yeah. One of the first things that came out when, when this whole thing started playing out, um, prominent golfers, uh, who were pro PGA Tour came out and mm -hmm. said, "Well, the, the amount of money that the these live guys are getting paid is 
is obscene, number one. Mm. And number two, if you're getting paid that much money, what incentive do you have to go and practice to work on your success cube? Have you noticed that there's a there's a, a decrease in work ethic amongst those golfers that are on the live tour? Or is it just business as usual from your experience? There's certainly a few guys that let themselves go slightly, <laughs> for sure. Mm. You know, and those guys that are at, at, they were at the end of their career, the twilight years, for sure. Knowing full well that, hey, if I take this opportunity, I'm going to make some, some good cash at the end of my career and I can, you know, ride off into the sunset, you know, uh, fairly comfortably. Um, you know, they've achieved great things in the game already, you know, for those guys. Mm. They fulfilled their why, those reasons for, for playing the game, you know, and it was an easy move for them in that sense. You know, there were other guys that, you know, are still early, pretty early in their career or actually kind of just starting to peak. I mean, Dean's probably an example of someone who was there. And that's why that decision was so hard was because it's like he knew what he was potentially giving up by going to live. Um, and it was, it was a lot, you know. But at the end of the day, Dean's why is very different to someone else's why. And they, they all, you know, we always want to stand there with the trophy. Don't get me wrong. Like that, that's why you stand as a kid on the putting green wants to make that putt. And, you know, it was to win the Masters. It wasn't to make, you know, $4 million. But, you know, at the end of the day, things change. And Dean's why is his family and looking after his family. And, and so, therefore, as hard as that decision was, <laughs> it, was a, it was the easiest decision ever because it meant that he could take care of his family you know, like that, almost, almost instantaneous. Yeah. Okay. But Dean obviously wasn't fortunate enough to get, you know, the massive big checks and pay that, that, that some of the, 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 the main flagship players got for going across. Cause those are the guys that are going to build the brands, be captains of the, each team. And so there was obviously even financial incentive for them to, to be that. And, you know, I can look at what, you know, what Louis and those guys are doing who are captains of their team, like they are fully vested and committed to making that work because they are financially as well as vested into making sure that the stingers and, you know, the high flyers are successful. I mean, Phil's literally put his head on the block there for this, you know. Mm. Um, so there were sacrifices that they've made and been willing to make for live, of which they've been well, you know, financially re remunerated, of course. But, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, when I look at guys out there, I mean, Brandon Grace said to me, he said he's never worked harder in his life because he sees a real financial windfall here that he can yeah. make. And he's saying, like, I'm, I'm working hard. And he is. He's crying. Yeah. And that's why he's playing so well. You look at his performances. I mean, he's one of the top performers in it. Um, yeah. Because, and he said that to Dean, like when we, we were in Florida, because they, they now live um, quite close to each other. And so practice together at the same golf club. And he was, I mean, I love Gracie. He's got the most eternal optimistic um, attitude and it's really a, a pleasure to be around. And he was like, yeah, in, his, in, in true Gracie form, he was like, yeah, Papa almost back, no, you know, type thing. Like, he's like, wait, boy, we got to work. Like, we had it now, it's that time, but you got to play, you know, because there's guys out there, probably, I'd say more than, more than two thirds who are there to play. They are working hard. They are, definitely. Obviously, the environment is, is different. And yeah, it, it's, it's way more pleasant, I won't lie, mm. than the PGA Tour. The PGA Tour, it's weird. Like the, the players there are very, they're very isolated or insulated around their team. So they have their entourage, whether it's whoever's around them, and they have a few players that they will engage with, their friends, whatever, and they don't break out of that. It's like a Cape Town school clicky thing, you know, but like it's very like protected. And so much so that we're like in live, there's the, the, the players have got their team, but they engage happily. And <clears throat> an example is, and I'll tell a story to this. When, when we first arrived in Mexico, I've obviously had interactions with Bryson DeChambeau in the past, and, but he's had no reason to engage with me at all, to be fair. Okay. In all honesty, I thought he was a bit of a douche because I, 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 he would never say hello or never engage or whatever acknowledge. You know, when we were on the PJ tour, we walk. I walk into the locker room in Mexico first day, and I walk straight up to him, or almost into him, walking in, and he stops. He put his hands on my shoulder. And he says, "Hey, man, it's good to see you here. Is Dean here?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I'm um, Bryson. He's actually upstairs in the players' lounge." He goes, "Oh, man, that's awesome. You guys are gonna love it out here. It's good to see you. Thanks for coming." You know, and he walked away and. I stood back going, 
okay, first and foremost, he knows exactly who I am, <laughs> you know, and it just shows you that in the past, he's always had to have this like veneer up to protect him from, you know, woe betide, he'd be shown to any, show any chink of weakness, you know, in his armor when you're on the pitch. Yeah. Versus now, it's like, hey, dude, we're all in this together. And, you know, people go, oh, well, you know, when you're on the live, you're playing for money. It's, it's not that. Like, I know that they invested in, in, in the brand and things, but the whole atmosphere around live is completely different to the PJ Tour. And, and I'm not it's knocking the PJ Tour. It's a very different culture difference. And it has to be that way, in a way. Because on the PJ Tour, man, it's, it's tough. Like, those guys can play. All of them can play. And, I mean, so much so, you look at the guys who, who we've brought through the ranks here, who are looking like they're on the on the high road to superstardom, and then they get on the PGA Tour and don't disappear, but really dissipate, you know? Mm. And that's the sad truth. It is so hot out there. It is, you know, you make one mistake on the PGA Tour, you make a bogey, you don't fall 15 spots, you fall 30 spots, you know? It's just, that's how the level of golf that's being played out there is so high, and those guys can play. They are so good. And I mean, I look at the leaderboards at the end of every day um, in, in the tournaments on the PGA Tour and like, you know, there's some really, really good players struggling, like really struggling. And I mean, these are guys that are, you know, they've got the game, they've got game. We know that, we've seen it. But now they, they're not going to make the playoffs and probably going to lose their card this year. You know, like it's, it really is cutthroat. And maybe that's part and parcel of why they feel they need to behave in a certain way, which for me is sad because, you know, so many times, you know, you've got to look at what got you to where you are and why would you change that when you get out onto a new, a new tour, a new environment, or a new playing field? Like, yeah, and I've seen this so many times, players, they grow out of one space and move into another and they feel like they need to change everything so that now they can fit in or be better or whatever. And they, they cut away people in their life, particularly people, who help get them to where they are, and they have someone that puts something in their head or in their ear about, oh, well, you know, no, I know you're on this tour, no, you, you, well, you need to get rid of those guys and you need to get these people involved, you know. You can't have that. Like, what? That's a lot of rubbish. Like, you got to this point yeah. doing what you're doing. Why would you change that? that? That unwavering commitment to that process has got you to this point. Like, why would you at that point, would you not decide, okay, well, I'm going to throw that all out and I'm going to start something new, try something different. It's, It's borderline insanity to be fair um but yeah. we see it you know every year i so often we see it but i suppose that's the nature of of the beast God. yeah yeah exactly exactly it's a, mm. it's a movie that's played many a time uh, yeah. unfortunately i want to take a different turn now so i want to mm. i want to take take a look at you personally i from my my experience of being a trainer and working with people and working with people really in direct contact for 12, 13 hours a day. Something that I'm always personally on, on, the, on a fine line with is burnout. I always feel as though, I mean, I've got to be super, super aware and self-aware of checking with myself on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. How am I feeling? What's going on? Um, because working with people all the time, it comes, it's, it's hugely rewarding, but everything comes at a cost and there is definitely a cost emotionally and mentally when you deal with people all the time. True. Um, how have you negotiated through that? Uh, I've been in a career that's as extensive as yours, you must have experienced that and had ups and downs. Um, how do you go, how do you move forward from there and how do you, how have you dealt with it in the past? Well, I think, you know, first and foremost, self-care is important, right? I can only be as effective for my clients um, as effective I am at looking after myself, first and foremost. So, you know, I, I work out. I'm not a guy that works out every single day. Don't get me wrong. I'm not one of those. I'm really dive into it that deep. But, you know, I'm, I'm pretty consistent with, with, with working out. Um, a big part is I, I'm a non-negotiable on, on sleep and on good quality nutrition. So, you know, my, my wife is also very fit and healthy, um, and we do not forgo good quality nutrition in our household. And, and I think that's key. You know, we, my wife would, uh, 
rather <laughs> be six foot under than be seen to be buying, you know, um, ready-made meals type thing. She believes in, in good quality home cooking, which is why I love her so much. But, you know, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, right? But Yeah, I can relate. I, this is, that, this is that, exactly it, the same. Yeah, there you go. You know, and it is, it's, a, it's essential. And I think, you know, if we all know the value of good nutrition. Right? And I mean, we've got to figure out what's right for you. But, you know, good quality nutrition in means that I can have good outputs, you know, going out afterwards. So nutrition is so important. And, and that, that for me, that's a non-negotiable. Um, I, I do believe in good, strong, um, you know, recovery strategies. Uh, I will I often be stretching. I drink a lot of water. I make sure I get good sleep. I use cold therapy. Um, not every day. I'm not that obsessed with it. But I have certainly found a lot of benefits in, in doing, you know, that type of cold therapy. Uh, ice bath, whatever people want to call it. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty diligent with that. Um, meditation, I think meditation is key. I think any time that you can spend time just alone with your own thoughts and trying to manage those thoughts and being able to recognize um, negative thoughts when they start to creep in, isolate them and, and deal with them appropriately, uh, that's important. And meditation is a great tool in which to do that. You just look at all the main captains of industry, they all do it, you know, in whatever shape yeah. or form, you know, for some people, it might be prayer, you know, because that's, you know, that that's in your, your religious beliefs. And prayer is a form of meditation, definitely, it's connecting with the, the, the greater, the greater being for sure. And, you know, I, I certainly believe in that wholeheartedly. Um, so meditation is a key, definite, um, I think, you know, with there's, there's, there are certain elements that people talk about when you, we listen to podcasts or whatever with really successful people. And meditation is one of the things that comes up very regularly, along with good quality sleep. I think those two things are, are essential. So, you know, looking after myself in that sense is, is important. Um, you know, being a fitness guy, you know, you, you've got to live the brand. You know, but, mm. but I'm not one of those that, that is going to spend you know, hours and hours in the gym, you know, really building my, my aesthetic um, ability uh, or aesthetic. That's what I'm looking for. You know, prowess. <laughs> it's actually yes, more about yes. Yeah, I need to be able to physically do what I expect my athletes to do. So like, I'll, I will never make them do an exercise that I physically can't do myself or are not willing to engage in myself. Um, mm. And so I'm willing to do that for sure. Um, knee injury uh, if excluded. But, yes. you know, I, I, um, I, I often train with my athletes just to try and push them and show them that, you know, I'm sometimes half their size physically. But yet I can lift exactly what they can because my technique is flawless. You know? And that's why I have mm. to explain that to them. So listen, how, how is it possible that I can lift what you can lift? Like when you look at it from the outside, that shouldn't be the case. And it just further validates when I say to them, listen, I need you to be attentive to your shoulder position when you do this. I need to have good scapular attraction when you do this because that's going to make you physically stronger. And when they see me do it, they're like, it just further validates, okay, you know what, there's a lot of there's a lot of benefit or gain to be made in good quality technique over above just getting big in the gym, you know, type thing. So yeah. um, it, uh, it's been interesting to see the, the humbling nature of, <laughs> of engaging in a training session with your trainer. And then uh, the, I see them go, holy moly, Jesus Creepers, I need to step up my game here. So that's, yeah, that's been yeah. a good action, yeah, for sure. Okay. Is there anything lately uh, that you've changed your mind on in terms of your career because it's everything's being you know science-based and we, we there's an element of learning and experience and it's always there's a never-ending pursuit of, of learning is there mm. something recently in your career it could be something technically as it could be in, in a way that you deal with people is there something recently over the over the last I don't know let's say six months that you've changed your philosophy or your approach on it's a very good question I mean I I was actually cleaning out some some old files and stuff the other day, and I happened to look at some of the programs that I was writing ten years ago, and I was actually quite horrified. You know, going, "Oh my word! I can't believe people <laughs> think to pay me for this." But anyway, but but that just shows you, it. Just shows you that you know now the stuff we know now. Back then, that's what we thought was right. That's the way things should be done. You know, and I'm looking yeah. at it going, "Oh my word! If only we'd known then what we know now." You know, on the flip side, it it, it also hasn't changed. Like. Mm. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, we're still dealing with a human being and a human athlete. I think one of the big things that certainly helped me as a trainer and helped my clients get better, you know, 
understanding of their bodies and self-awareness has been, you know, wearables. You know, so I, I use Whoop. Um, you guys can wear garments, whatever there is. There's a multitude of different ones out there that you can use. But that constant tracking of my metabolic data, my better metabolic health has really helped me validate with my clients as to why certain things are important because they can see the physiological effect it has on their body and then what it does for them mentally or spiritual, whatever it is they're after. And so much so that to the point is where some of them, they don't even need to have the device on to know where they're going to be. Um, and like I have a guy, I mean, th just this morning, I had a, one of my golfers, I saw him yesterday we were doing a workout and I could see he was struggling. And I said to him, listen, are you okay? And he goes, no, I don't know. I'm just being a bit short of breath. And I said, well, what, what was your number? He says, no, I'm yellow. I'm in the yellow zone. But my semi-respiratory rate was up. So I said, well, careful, dude. You might be getting sick. Sure enough, this morning, both sends me a screenshot of his, his whoop recovery. 19% in the red. Respiratory rate is through the roof. He says, I'm definitely sick. I'm going to the doctor. Yeah. So it was almost it showed a precursor to that, the fact that he had a virus or something coming on. Uh, maybe his body's just run down. I don't know. We'll, we'll wait and see. But, you know, he um, it helped me then see that. And I then pulled back the, the, the training that we were doing for the day. So... It was a case of looking at it going, okay, well, just because of the program that I'd written said that we needed to do these eight things, doesn't mean that that athlete should engage in that today because maybe they're not physiologically ready to do that and therefore they're not going to get the benefit. In fact, it could actually be have a negative effect on their body. You know? yeah. And being able to read that and predict that has been massive because so many times it was, it was program-driven training. Now... The training is athlete-driven training. So all my guys, they have they wear whoops, and they know what the, the numbers are, be a regular green or where they're at. And if they're in the green, then it's go time. Then they've got their programs, and they know which program to grab. Okay. If they're in the yellow, there's this. And if they're in the red, they know, okay, well, listen, just because Garth says that I need to do you know, my powerlifting program today, well, I'm, I'm at like 38%. I'm in the yellow, but I probably shouldn't do that. So I'm actually going to forego that today, and I'm going to do my rest and recovery program. And then sure enough, tomorrow they're back in the green, and then they can do their, their, their powerlifting program. So it, it's athlete-driven rather than program outside entity extrinsically driven, which is great because then my athletes actually get the benefit of that. And those windows of trainability that, that are there, we can now target those and hit those correctly. And I think that's probably been... From my standpoint, the most revolutionary piece of kit or training that that, that training um, advice or advancement that that I've embraced because of the value that it's brought to myself and to my athletes and to our relationship. Yeah, you know, I can on my platform I have you know, accessibility to all my athletes' um, data, and I mean they can be in Spain and I can see what's going on. And I've I've had the situation where I've then message them and say, hey, listen, what's going on? Why are you in the, you've been in the yellow the last two days? He goes, oh, gee, the bed is uncomfortable. I'm struggling to see. And so then we can find, you know, strategies to, to fix that. Or, you know, I'll say, well, listen, your hydration, have you been drinking water? No, probably not enough. I say, well, drink water. Like, let's get that back up to, to speed. Your HRV is really low. Sure enough, they drink two liters of water before they go to bed, wake up in the morning in the green. Like, they were just dehydrated. <laughs> so that, the, there's these little things where we can continue monitor them. And those marginal gains, in, like I said, in this sport nowadays, because of these guys are professional athletes, those marginal gains play a huge role in their ability to perform consistently. I love that. I love that philosophy. That is, um, that's very, very good, actually. Mm. G, what has you most excited about the near future? Near future? Mm, oh, no. what, have you got go what have you got going on um, the rest of the year that's got you super excited? Uh, I mean... Obviously, we've got the big run into the end of the seasons now. I mean, it's, I mean, it's only just the start of August, but I mean, uh, it's, it's busy, busy for me, the travel thing. Um, from a professional perspective? Um, Anything. Could be personal. What's yeah, I mean, I, look, obviously, professionally, let's I'll be honest. I mean, obviously, the, this run in from the Stingers and, and the Love and, and where Dean is and where they're going. I'm excited about what that holds for them. They're in a good position. Um you know, I, I'm really excited for, I've got a couple of youngsters that I'm working with on, on the Sunshine Tour and, and two really lovely, lovely gentlemen, Martin Foster and Giovanni Rabula. And 
really am enjoying spending time with them. Young guys, very passionate, very dedicated, very committed to their craft, very different ways of going about things, but yet still have those key commonalities that are kind of are keys to success. And I've seen them in, in all successful golfers. And funny, I haven't seen them in those that have not been successful. And these two guys certainly have that. Um, also, just two stand-up quality human beings as well. So I love spending time with them. Um, and I think, you know, for me, I'm, I'm excited by what their futures have in store. And I'm really enjoying being part of their journey. And I really look forward to, to futures with them because it's almost like, you know, I've, I've, I've been fortunate enough to work with some really good players and help them on this journey. And, and sometimes that journey has come to an end for me, but their journey's continued on. And it's exciting to be back at this stage again with new, young, you know, excited, dedicated, committed um, young men. And like, I'm really enjoying being part of that journey with them um, again, you know, and it's almost like, you know, that, that, that new relationship fostering those new engagements and stuff, it, it really is, it's very rewarding in that sense. Um, and it's nice when they, when they acknowledge that. And that, that's amazing. And I've got a lot of respect for them, and, and I, I know that they've got respect for me, and that just makes it so much more um, more pleasant. Yeah, yeah. I, it really, like you said, I get up in the morning, I can't wait to get to work to see them because I know I know what that day is going to bring, and I know that it's going to be amazing. Yeah, you know, as long as we both bring the same sort of level of uh, commitment to it. And you know, this is the thing: is like you you said earlier, like we we have to as trainers, we have to give so much. You know, let's say one of them arrives and they're excited, like I have to get up and get on their level. So like, let's go, let's go. Then the next guy arrives and he's like, oh, the tie today or had a tough day, had an argument with my girlfriend or whatever's going on. And like, I need to get in that space and try and pick them up and get them ready to go. So, you know, we, we give so much as, as trainers to our, to our clients. And I think, you know, that's where you spoke about, you know, self-care, self-health. I think it's important that we have something that we engage in that's purely for us in that sense. You know, so music has always been my big one and I, I really do enjoy Music, I, it goes back to when I was living in London and I think it was, you know, enjoying the dance scene and I was DJing and all these sort of things. And I kind of put the, nice. I, 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 when I got back here, I bought myself a set of decks and played for a, a few a few years, but they've been packed away. Now, maybe maybe that's something I should look forward to. Maybe I should get the, the old decks out again and, and, and jump on the ones and twos. Maybe, maybe you should. You could also <laughs> take it over with you to live. That would be great. Yeah. You well, yeah, I don't know. I can't compete fit. with can't compete with the lesser and those guys. <laughs> 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 uh, <it's fair. laughs> uh, anyway, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll break up my success cube and have a look at that and see how yes. I go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> see what your attitudes like towards your towards your music well, and, and your work rate. Yeah, get that right, and I'll put in the time and develop my DJing skills again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. God, this has been fantastic. Oh man, um, it's been such a cool chat. Very easy, and I love what we covered and what we discussed today. Where can people find you if they want to find you on Insta, or if there's websites that you want to direct them to? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, I mean, it's on social media handles on Instagram, it's it's Smiley Milne, my nickname is Smiley, so it's Smiley Milne. Um, and then obviously, want to be a champion is uh, is the the company that my colleague Dougie Wood and I started. We run sort of three academies throughout South Africa. And that's, uh, you can get us at wannabeachampion.com. That's wannabeachampion there. That's our logo. And um, oh. been fortunate enough to spend a lot of time with with you know, people that are smarter than myself in, in, in building and growing Wanna Be A Champion. And we've got some wonderful people uh, who are on our teams um, at the three locations. And um, yeah, just jump on online, Wanna Be A Champion, or else get hold of me on uh, Smiley Mall at Insta. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. God, really appreciate your time. Much, Thank eh? you. Yeah, Thank you. pleasure. Thank you. Cheers, eh? Cheers. Bye. Bye. Wait, before you go, before you go, did you enjoy that episode as much as I did hosting it? Please go on to Apple Podcasts or to Spotify rate the show, follow the show, subscribe to the show, leave a comment and a review. Every little bit helps. The more reviews that the show gets, the more traction it's going to get, which means that the guests get better and better, the value gets better and better, and then we can continue to grow together and be better as a community. Thank you very much. Have a great day.